there's essentially zero evidence that carbohydrates cause insulin resistance. Removing carbohydrates is valuable for some people when they are insulin resistant because the process of insulin resistance, that pathology, leads to broken metabolic machinery. So you can't really use carbohydrates well when you're insulin resistant, when you're metabolically unwell, but the carbohydrates didn't get you there. So yes, it totally makes sense and there is a utility to say you've got you know, a car that runs on gasoline and electric and the car gets broken and it can't use gasoline anymore very well. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a point to just like, okay, let it use electric for a little while until you can fix the gasoline engine. But the gasoline didn't break the gasoline engine. I'm sort of stretching this metaphor. Like the carbohydrates don't cause insulin resistance, right? They just are not processed well by broken metabolic machinery. So you can remove them. The other thing to understand is that you can also just fix your metabolic health without completely removing the carbohydrates in the first place. You can just lower the carbohydrates. Again, your engine is not gonna run on these very well. Your metabolic machinery is broken. And we can talk about why I think people become insulin resistant because that is probably at the center of our modern epidemic of chronic disease. And it's not carbohydrates. It's just not. Even, I mean, there's nuance there, but it's not carbohydrates. It's not things like fruit. It's not things like honey. It's probably not even things like white potatoes. Those don't make people insulin resistant, even though I'm not a fan of them. It's something else. So I think that if you have a broken metabolic machinery, yeah, you can lower it. I think people actually do better with 50, 90 grams of carbohydrates rather than zero grams of carbohydrates per day if they want to get low carb or moderate carb. But I think, yeah, there's, there's some time period in which you can lower that and then increase it eventually and do better. I think people run into trouble when they start to believe that the carbohydrates are the problem. And it's not the removal of carbohydrates that really fixes the insulin resistance. So that, that is something I would disagree with. Removing carbohydrates doesn't fix insulin resistance. You're removing the, the fuel that can't be burned, right? But the insulin resistance is more at a cellular membrane level, the mitochondrial membrane level, and that gets fixed over time when you eliminate, I think it's the omega-6 seed oils, the omega-6 polyunsaturated oils that are the problem there. And that takes a little more time to change out. So there's ways to accelerate that perhaps as well. But that's, that's the perspective that I have on it. All right. And this is really fascinating. I want to take some time and really get into it. And you left us hanging for a while there and then got into it. And I really want to get into the nuance. So it's not the carbs that are causing insulin resistance. You've touched on it, but let's get into the physiology of why these seed oils, what I'm hearing from you are, is these are at the root of insulin resistance. Do you know who Walter Kempner is? No, I don't. So he's an interesting fellow, kind of a controversial guy from the 1940s and 1950s, maybe the 1960s. He's a physician who did a bunch of studies with diabetics, people that were morbidly obese, morbidly obese. We're talking hundreds of pounds obesity. If your team wants to find images, you can see the study. So he has this thing called the rice diet. And in the 1950s and 1960s, he put people on a very, very high carb, very low fat, very low protein diet. It was essentially white sugar, so sucrose, and white rice was the majority of the diet. And they got better. <laughs> they lost, I mean, some people went from like literally being round to being thin. Their diabetes got better. So he fixed diabetes with a very high carb, very low fat, very low protein diet. And it was by necessity, it was a low protein because it was all carbohydrates. And the problem is that the human brain doesn't want to do this. <laughs> like, so he's controversial because in order to get his patients to do this, he had to like, he had to do some crazy things to cajole them. And so I'm not condoning his experiments, but the science is is interesting. And what it says about human physiology to me is, is very compelling that you can give someone a diet of pure white sugar and rice and their diabetes gets better. Why does their diabetes get better? And this is not even short term. This is long term. So that in the span of, I think it was four to six months, he could then liberalize these people's diets and their diabetes did not return. So this is really interesting to me. And I think it kind of ties into the seed oil piece. And I'm not suggesting that this is a, a reasonable therapy for people because what we know about human physiology and the human brain 
is that if you try to push any of the macros too far, our brain really rebels. Humans seem to be able to lose weight by cutting carbohydrates or cutting fat. If you cut both of them together, you have what's called rabbit starvation, and you can lose a lot of weight very quickly, but it's very stressful on the body hormonally. If you cut carbohydrates, you have a ketogenic diet. If you cut fat, you have a low fat diet. And if you look at the trials head to head of low fat or low carb, they both have about the same amount of weight loss. So there's some contention, but it doesn't really look like a ketogenic diet is magical for weight loss. It doesn't look like a low fat diet is magical for weight loss relative to keto. They both work. But when you cut both, when you cut the, the fat really, really low, that's interesting to me. And this is what happened in the rice diet. And they, the, the fat was so low that these pro people were probably becoming fatty acid deficient. And there's a fatty acid that you can measure in the human blood, it's called mead acid, M-E-A-D. And that's an indication of fatty acid deficiency, essential quote unquote fatty acid deficiency. And so the hypothesis is that one of the reasons this diet might have worked is because when you restrict fat that much, the cell has to turn over those cell membranes in a different way. And that probably causes a lot of these polyunsaturated fats that are stuck in the cell membranes to become mobilized and turn over. The human body doesn't make polyunsaturated fats. But if you feed someone carbohydrates, the human body can make saturated fats and monounsaturated fats. But this is essentially an accelerated way to get rid of what were potentially excess polyunsaturated fatty acids in these people's cell membranes. Again, I don't think this is a good therapy for humans because it's so hard on the brain. Humans don't want to do this. We sort of gravitate toward like a third fat, a third carbohydrates, and maybe a third protein, depending how you're looking at it. Maybe a little less if you're doing grams or calories, but there's some balance of those things that kind of is what our body tends to. If you go too low fat, your body will rebel. And you know if you go too low carb, your body's like, I want some carbohydrates. So the indication here is there's something going on in these cell membranes, and there's a massive shift that happens in the cell membrane when you get very, very low fat. And I think that's having to do with this turnover of these omega-6 fatty acids. So there's a couple of ways to do this without going so low fat. You can also just get them out of your diet, like extremely intentionally, and then do more fats that are saturated in their place. And so this is the part where it gets a little bit cumbersome for people to think about, but I think that you can get similar results by just having a low linoleic acid diet. So let's back up for a moment, talk about linoleic acid. Omega-6, which means that six carbons from the end of the molecule is the first double bond. It's an 18 carbon molecule. It's polyunsaturated, which means it has multiple double bonds. And there's a small amount in ruminant fat. So things like cows or goats or bison or lamb, sheep, deer, small amount, one to 2%. But animals like humans or pigs or chickens that are monogastric accumulate linoleic acid. So the more of this fatty acid we eat, the more we store. We don't have a way to get rid of it like cows do. Cows can transform it. So it, where do we find linoleic acid in the human diet? We find it in chickens and pigs that are fed corn and soy, so evolutionarily inappropriate diets, and you find it in nuts and seeds, plant foods. And we have a massive input of this linoleic acid into the human diet now because we're feeding our animals corn and soy, things that they've never eaten historically, and all of our processed food is combined is added with these seed oils, things like corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, grape seed, these are all seed oils. And they contain between 25 and 65% linoleic acid. So what you have, I think, is an evolutionarily inconsistent amount of linoleic acid coming into the human diet. And just like pigs, just like chickens, when we eat corn and soy, when we eat foods, when we eat seed oils that have a lot of this linoleic acid, we store it. And I think that over time, it accumulates in our cell membranes and in the membranes of our mitochondria, these little powerhouses in the cell, and causes problems. And we can get into how it might cause problems at the cellular level if you want, but that's kind of the, the 15,000 foot perspective, that we have this, this fatty acid that is in our food supply historically, but when we are living in a, quote, naturalistic way in the forest, in the jungle, there's really very limited access to foods that are high in this. It's very hard to get the amount of seeds that you would get even in three to five tablespoons of seed oils. So I've done some content about this. You look at corn oil, for instance, or rice bran oil is an even better example. Chipotle is very, very popular. 
And I went to Chipotle and I asked, what do you cook your food? And they said, rice bran oil. So it's the oil extracted from the bran of the rice. Okay. They put three to five tablespoons of rice bran oil into a, a bowl, like a burrito bowl or a burrito with the rice and the beans and the, the meat that are cooking in there. To get three to five tablespoons of rice bran oil, you'd have to eat something like three to four pounds of rice. So something that humans would never ever do, right? It's the same with sunflower seeds. Sunflower seed oil is in almost everything. Soybean oil is very common. Corn oil, to get three to five tablespoons of corn oil, you have to eat somewhere between 60 and 75 ears of corn. So you can see here that we have now, even if we were eating an occasional sunflower seed from a sunflower plant because we're starving as humans historically, or we're eating a little bit of rice and getting the oil from the bran, or we're eating some corn in Native American population, we're never gonna get anywhere close to the amount of linoleic acid coming into our bodies in 2023. And really this amount has been increasing massively over the last 100 to 110 years in the human diet. So I think it's a very interesting thing to see, okay, linoleic acid is just massively increased in our diets. It gets in our cell membranes, it gets stuck there, and then it causes things to kind of shift in a negative way metabolically. Does that make sense? Yeah, a lot there I want to dig into. So just to make sure I have this correct, when it comes to our metabolic health and insulin resistance, you're saying the root of that is this linoleic acid that's getting taken up because we're consuming too much of it, primarily through seed oils. They're becoming part of the cell membranes and they're, for lack of a better term, gunking things up, which I want to get into what's happening there in, in a few minutes. But before I do... I want to be clear on linoleic acid. It sounds like there's a little bit within animal products. Is that small true? Amount. Yeah. Okay. Small amount. So it's not like we're looking to totally eliminate it. It's just about the ratio. It's way off. We're getting way too much. Way, way too much. And you can look at the amount of calories from linoleic acid in your diet. You can even do something like chronometer. And if I put my diet into chronometer, you can see how many calories you're getting and all the breakdown of the micronutrients, it'll tell you how many percent of your calories are coming from linoleic acid or coming from omega-6, which is mostly linoleic acid. And when I do that, it's usually below 2% of my daily calories. The average American is probably upwards of 10 to 12% of their daily calories. Maybe even 15% of your calories are from linoleic acid. So it's, it's easy to measure. And if you look at one of those programs, you can see, but it's, there's a difference. And if you look at hunter-gatherer populations, this has been studied. It's, it's never more than like two and a half percent of their calories from linoleic acid. It just doesn't exist in nature. It doesn't exist. The only exception might be something like the koi san in Botswana when they eat the mongongo nuts. But you can also see that when they eat the mongongo nuts during that season, they also become more fat. So it's like, it's, it's the one hunter gatherer population that in the last 30 to 40 years that they've been studied is doing this behavior where they're eating a huge amount of nuts they're probably eating the nuts because their hunting lands are being encroached on. They can't hunt animals and it's one of their survival foods. And you can see that they're getting a more linoleic acid than other traditional hunter gatherer populations. But when they do that, their metabolic indices, at least ostensibly seem to suffer. But you look at populations like the Hadza who I visited in Tanzania, they're not getting linoleic acid from anything except animal fat. They're not eating any seeds unless they're starving. They're obviously not eating any seed oils. They're not eating any chickens or pigs that are fed corn and soy. So it's very rare in nature. All right, well, let's continue the story. So we know linoleic acid is getting incorporated into cell membranes, gunking up the cell. Let's talk about now the physiology of how that leads to insulin resistance. There's probably a couple of ways. So most people would agree that insulin resistance is caused by broken fat cells. So it's the adipose tissue, I believe, that initiates insulin resistance in the periphery, at the liver and at the muscle primarily, but everywhere, really. And the way that that happens is because of these lipokines, these signals that are sent out from the fat cells when the fat cells are broken. So the fat cells are very smart. We think of fat as just like a bag of fat, but our fat cells have nuclei, they have DNA, they have mitochondria, and they release signals to the rest of the body. And so what appears to happen is that when you stuff the fat cells first with too much linoleic acid, they can't divide. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. This is hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. 
So hyperplasia is when a tissue divides and you get more cells. Hypertrophy is when one cell just gets very big. Like you think of hypertrophy like a, like a bodybuilder gets a big bicep, but your fat cell just gets really big. And so there's lots of evidence that these products of linoleic acid breakdown, which are unique to linoleic acid and don't come from anywhere but linoleic acid, things like 4-HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol and others, are like intimately connected with breaking fat cell division. There's articles that have that exact title, you know, 4-HNE leads to fat cell dysplasia. So you get these big ballooning fat cells because of these products of linoleic acid breakdown, 4-HNE and others. And then the fat cells can't divide like they're supposed to. It kind of breaks their normal cell division and they start leaking inflammatory mediators. They leak fat signals to the periphery. They leak lipokines. And then you get essentially increased levels of fat in the blood. And you see this in a lot of conditions where you have non-esterified fatty acids in the blood. And that signals to the muscles to become insulin resistant. And this is similar in some ways to what happens when you don't eat carbohydrates. Because when you don't eat carbohydrates, you have more non-esterified fatty acids in the blood. The difference is that you don't have broken fat cells on the back end, you just have fat cells that are signaling to the muscles, hey, don't take up glucose because we're trying to conserve the glucose for the brain, the testicles, the ovaries, the adrenals. It's like this physiologic insulin resistance. But in pathologic insulin resistance, you have these fat cells that are doing this all the time. And an insulin signal can't turn that off. So insulin is not necessarily anabolic, it's anti-catabolic. So insulin is meant to signal to those fat cells to stop releasing these non-esterified fatty acids. But when they become insulin resistant, when the fat cells become insulin resistant, they, they just release these things all the time. All the time, they're just spewing out these mediators saying, be insulin resistant, be insulin resistant to the liver, to the muscles. And so your muscles become insulin resistant, your liver becomes insulin resistant, and that leads to all sorts of problems. And that is sort of the genesis of what we see in metabolic dysfunction, diabetes, prediabetes. At a deeper cellular level, people also believe that these, non, these, these linoleic acid molecules become incorporated into something called cardiolipin in the mitochondrial wall. And this may have to do with why the fat cells get broken at the level of the mitochondria. That these mitochondria have these, I think there's four tails on a, a cardiolipin molecule. It could be three, but it, I think it's four. And they have these fatty acids on, on their tails and they're at the curves of these intermitochondrial membrane, these cristae. And when they get overly populated with linoleic acid, it probably creates changes in the way the mitochondrial membrane works and that may cause mitochondrial dysfunction. So ultimately, it looks like excess linoleic acid is causing changes in cellular signaling, leading to broken fat cells. And that leads to inappropriate signals to the rest of the body. And we have good models of this happening. There's actually a condition called Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy, and it's a monogenic condition of insulin resistance. So it's monogenic, it's one gene. It's a gene called LMNA. And these people have insulin resistance because of one gene mutation. And it causes basically, they're, they look very lean, but they have tons of visceral adipose tissue and their non-esterified fatty acids are through the roof because they're just spewing out all these mediators from their fat cells into the blood and they get profound insulin resistance. And with that, they also get accelerated atherosclerosis. So accelerated cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, people with Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy don't have elevated LDL. They just have profound insulin resistance and they get aggressive cardiovascular disease. All right, so putting this whole puzzle together, coming back to the ketogenic diet, lowering carbs, lowering insulin, we know that this does work, but again, coming back to what you said before, this isn't getting to the root of the problem. It's a workaround. So we're not denying that that can be a workaround and you can use that as a tool. But what you're talking about here, changing up the cell membranes, getting the proper fat in, that's getting to the root. Exactly. Exactly. So we know seed oils are a big part of the problem here. We know that animal products contain a little bit of this linoleic acid, but not enough that it's actually an issue. What about oils like coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, ones that get a pass in the health and wellness space as being good quality oils? How do they fit on this spectrum? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So you can really just make a continuum of the amount of linoleic acid in any oil. So butter, tallow, one to 
Coconut oil, 2%. You see a big jump when you go to avocado and olive, and it can be anywhere from 8 to 20% linoleic acid in both of those. So some olive oil is 8%, some olive oil is 20%, about the same for avocado. It generally ends up in the 12 to 14% linoleic acid range for those oils. They're better than seed oils because they're not refined, bleached, and deodorized. So to get oil out of a corn granule, right, you have to crush it and squeeze it and heat it and extract it and use hexane and bleaching agents. To get oil out of olives, you just press them. I mean, you can do it on your counter. You can just smash an olive in your hand and you'll get olive oil in your hand. The problem with avocado and olive is not the way they're prepared. The problem is twofold, in my opinion. The first being the most problematic piece, which is that they're often adulterated. Because these are more expensive oils that are becoming more in vogue, if you look at the literature, there's clear evidence that both avocado and olive, more than 50% of the time, are cut with seed oils. And very often, their peroxide values, which means their oxidation levels of the oils, the fatty acids in there, are higher than preferred, meaning that they're, they're old. So when you look at a fat, you have saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats are the most likely to oxidize. They're the least stable. The more double bonds, the more unstable a molecule is. So people may not know this, but omega-3 fatty acids are the least stable of any fatty acid because they have so many double bonds. So I think that humans benefit from omega-3 fatty acids in foods, but I'm not a fan of any sort of omega-3 fatty acid taken as an extraction. And some people will say, but I have this bottle of fish oil and it's a bottle that's open to the air. It's like a, you cannot have a bottle of fish oil open to the air. That's massively oxidized. That's just not a, it's just, it's too fragile. You can't do that. Even if you put it in a capsule, it's fragile enough that it's going to be highly oxidized. So if you want to get omega-3 from fish, that's fine. I think there's plenty of omega-3 for humans and things like egg yolks, animal fats, even tallow, like beef fat has plenty of omega-3. That's a whole separate conversation. So omega-6, this linoleic acid, returning to that, it's going to oxidize quite a bit. That's a problem for humans in a big way. So you're gonna get oxidation of olive oil, you're gonna get oxidation of avocado. Theoretically, if you know people in Italy and you're there when they're pressing the olive oil and those are organic olives and you're not heating it and you're packaging it in glass, it's probably pretty benign for humans. But again, I think that there is some argument to be made that if someone is metabolically unwell and you want to be metabolically healthier, healthier sooner, the, the speed with which you approach that metabolic health is probably proportional to the amount of linoleic acid in your diet or inversely proportional, if you see what I'm saying. Kind of like the rice diet people. I think if someone is unwell, they would do well or they would be better served by having the smallest amount of linoleic acid possible in their diet, right? And cooking with olive oil is not a good idea because you shouldn't heat an oil that's that fragile, nor avocado. But look, I want to make it, I don't want it to be impossible for people, but ideally speaking, I think if someone is unwell, you'd want to have the smallest amount of linoleic acid possible in your diet. And avocado and olive are not great for that because they have more and they're often cut with seed oils. They're often oxidized and kind of rancid. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just trying to picture somebody in a position like you talked about that's trying to, I guess a good analogy would be doing an oil change, almost like you're doing an oil change for your car where you're trying to switch out the linoleic acid in your cell membranes for better fats. So we know on one extreme, we have the rice and the sugar diet, which is going to be changing that up the quickest. But say there's somebody that cuts out the seed oils, they're eating whole foods, they're taking these other oils we're talking about, olive oil, coconut oil, avocado oil out and switching up to tallow. How long would it take to change that up and to renew their cell membranes? We don't have great data here. There's one paper on the kinetics of changing the cell membranes. And it suggests like two years, but I think that it can go faster if you just cl my clinical observation and suspicion is that it can go faster if you do those things. 
Now, I think most people are going to get some, they're going to get some olive oil. They're going to get some avocado oil. And if you really want to get like brass tacks here, it gets to a point where people, it's not popular because you have to look at things like what is the chicken that you're eating. Now, chicken is generally pretty lean, so you're not going to get a lot of fat from that chicken. Poultry, lean. Duck, sometimes more fatty. And duck is the same way. If that duck is fed corn and soy, it's going to have more linoleic acid in the membrane. Pork is probably a problem for a lot of people because if people are eating pork, they're usually eating fatty pork, particularly bacon. And so if you really wanted to do this quickly, look, bacon is a meat. It's way better than other foods, in my opinion. It's better than processed food. It's better than seed oils. But bacon can have 15% linoleic acid in it also. And then you're getting a lot of fat in that bacon because it's really fatty. So it's never popular when I talk about getting rid of bacon from your diet, but I think that that can slow the progression for some people because linoleic acid comes from seed oils. It comes from you know olive oil, avocado oil, chicken and pork fed corn and soy, which is 99.5% of all chicken and pork. And it, that, those are the major sources, even eggs unfortunately, can have significant amounts of linoleic acid if the chickens are fed corn and soy. And this is sort of just this discordant place that we find ourselves in, in the universe, in, in our planet, in 2023. It's hard to find chickens that are fed bugs, right? It's hard to find pigs that are wild and not just fed corn and soy. Those are the types of animals we would have eaten. You know, if I'm in Tanzania and we're hunting a bush pig with the Hadza, the animal's not eating corn and soy. If you look at wild pigs, the fatty tissue is four to 5% linoleic acid. The same for chickens and other fowl, right? Four to 5%. But you put those things in captivity and you feed them grains, 15, 20%, it's crazy. So again, if someone is metabolically healthy, maybe not a big deal. But if you're unwell, if you're obese, if you're diabetic, pre-diabetic, and you really want to get fast, you wanna get healthy as fast as possible, then I think there is, some, there is some benefit to thinking about getting that linoleic acid as low as possible, at least in the short term. And then it's kind of like the carbohydrates, right? Maybe you do a low linoleic acid diet for four to six months, and then you can liberalize and have olive oil on your salad or whatever. I mean, we can talk about salad. That's a whole separate conversation. You want to have some olive oil? Fine. You want to have some avocado oil? Fine. You want to eat some regular chicken? Okay. If you want to eat some bacon in six months, fine. But it's just... I think that there is a way to approach that level of balance more quickly. And it just depends how intentional and how detailed people want to get. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I can imagine for a lot of people that are eating healthy and they want to make steps in this direction, like we're talking about, an area they'd really need to address is eating out. And that's controversial of whether that could even be considered healthy because there's so many oils that are used in cooking that we're unaware of even when we're at these quote unquote healthier restaurants and eating eating, you know, meats and some of the things you'd advocate for. Most of the time, if you go to a steakhouse, they're just going to cook that steak on the grill every once in a while. Cause I do this a lot when I go to cities, I'll go to restaurants and ask them what they're cooking in. And if they're cooking chicken on a grill, on a griddle, on like a flat top, they might be cooking chicken in canola oil or sunflower oil. If there's a sauce, it's likely that sauce is going to have some seed oils in it. But if you're just getting a steak, the majority of the time, you're pretty darn safe. Steak is pretty safe. A lot of time it's cooked in tallow or it's just cooked on a grill. So I think that makes it, that makes it better in a lot of ways for people. It makes it easier to get that, you know? One of the pieces of your work that I really appreciate, and you've touched on this, the fact that we can't just look at what we're eating, we have to go all the way back to what that animal's eating when we're having proteins and animal products. I find a lot of the people in the carnivore world are big on consuming meat and aren't necessarily always concerned about the quality of that meat. And one thing that comes up in your work time and time again is to be aware of what these animals are eating and how that changes the nutrient profile of that food for us. Talk more about that and the importance, because again, this is something that's really central to your message. Yeah, this is interesting. So as much as I don't want 
this to be an impediment for people. And as much as I believe that making any intentional change in your diet is going to improve your health, I do think, I do hope that it's also valuable to give people a North Star and to give them an ideal way for a diet to look for them to shoot for. I don't want it to be unreachable. And so I think that that ideal situation of diet is eating plant foods that are organic. I predominantly eat fruit. I eat exclusively fruit, but whatever plant foods people want to eat, those would be organic. The honey that I eat is glyphosate free. So it's from farms that are organic and not near any place that's spraying glyphosate. So that's important to know about your honey. The milk I get is raw. And again, this is all just the North Star. If we can create the ideal situation, the milk is raw and hopefully those cows are fed grass exclusively. And hopefully those cows are raised on land that it doesn't, isn't sprayed with pesticides and the meat and organs that I eat are from grass fed grass finished cows. So as I mentioned earlier, the interesting thing about cows and also bison or deer or elk or antelope is that these are ruminant animals. And if you feed a cow corn, it's not really going to increase the amount of linoleic acid in the fatty tissue significantly. The problem, as I see it, with corn finished cattle, that's cattle that's raised on grass and then finished the last three to four months of its life on grains, is that these animals then accumulate everything that's in that corn. And that corn can be moldy. That corn can have microplastics because a lot of this feed is low quality. And that corn almost certainly has pesticides. So if you look at the muscle and fat tissue of grass-fed, grass-finished animals, there are two things that you notice. Grass-feeding, grass grass-finishing grass feeding, grass animals leads to lower amounts of pesticides and toxins in the meat, whether it's hormones, whether it's pharmaceutical drugs, whether it's mold toxins, whether it's microplastics, glyphosate. And there are some nutrients that are significantly higher in that type of meat. So you're basically taking a, a cow and that's an herbivore and you're giving it its ideal diet, which is more nutrient rich grass, something that humans can't eat, by the way, we cannot eat grass it's toxic for humans because of the amount of silica. So cows can take this grass and make it into valuable meat and organs for humans. And you're replacing that in a significant amount of the cattle grown in the U S or in the world with inferior quality food. And anyone that's ever been to a nice restaurant or is a foodie in any way, shape or form, or likes good wine or good chocolate or anything can appreciate that quality matters. <laughs> and the reason that quality matters is if you like nice cars or whatever you like, right? Quality matters. And so the nutrients in a food are often reflected in the taste, the complexity of the taste, and that's, that's significant. So if you've been to a really nice steakhouse and you had grass fed meat at a steakhouse, which isn't actually that, it's not served that often at steakhouses because it's leaner. But if you've had a really good grass fed steak or you've had a good, I don't know, honey or good milk, you know that there's a difference in quality when animals are fed what they're supposed to be eating. And that's really a reflection, I would say, of the nutrient profile. And then if you look at the literature, the absence of other harmful things in these foods. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. The carnivore community hates me. The ketogenic community hates me. The vegans don't like what I'm saying. You can give someone a diet of pure white sugar and rice and their diabetes gets better. You get less, significantly less benefits from working out.